Good evening and welcome to my book chat. My name is Melody and I'm oh, oh I hear some feedback. Sorry guys, I was in my introduction. Do you hear the feedback? A little bit. I think we're good. No? Oh. Now it's better. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, because I wrote out my um I wrote out my speech so I would sound like a professional tonight. So I'll I'll start with that again. Do it again then. <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. Good yeah. evening and welcome to my book chat. My name is Melody and I'm so glad you're here, whether you're streaming us through YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Thank you, Alice Keeler, for letting us use your platform to broadcast the amazing work of authors and educators. It's Teacher Appreciation Week, but we appreciate you every day. So glad to have Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy with me tonight and their book, Project-Based Learning, Real Questions, Real Answers, How to Unpack PBL and Inquiry. Ross and Aaron, how are you tonight? Tell us a little bit about yourself and background, and then we'll get into this awesome book. Okay. So, uh, Ross is for first. whoever goes first. Aaron, go first. Aaron, go ahead. <laughs> Aaron, go first. <laughs> so, I'm Aaron Murphy. I am the humanities supervisor in a school district in um, eastern Pennsylvania. And um, I currently, as I said, I'm the humanities supervisor, but I have teaching experience in kindergarten, second, third, fifth grade. I was middle school assistant principal, um, a tech coach for a while. So I've done a lot of things, but I'm really excited to work in um, on the central office admin team now because I get to work with all of our buildings and all of our kids. You're all over. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great, um, you know, vast experience that you have. Ross is going to talk about you, Ross. <laughs> yeah, so um, originally from Trumbull, Connecticut, I've had some experience, educational experience in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and now I'm in New York as an assistant principal in Chappaqua Central School District. I've been um, a principal. I've been a K-12 curriculum supervisor. I've been done some special ed, third grade, and uh, in the classroom, mostly fourth grade. Across a uh, across a couple of states, so it's it's been great. And Aaron and I met when we were in the same building in the East Penn School District. I taught fourth grade, and she taught fifth grade. I like to tell people that I had to fix all of his mistakes. And thank you for continuing to set me up for that little comment, Ross. I just really appreciate that. No, no problem, no problem. Many many mistakes, many mistakes. No. But, but we're good. Everybody I, makes mistakes. So yeah. That's good. It's yeah, true. Okay. It's true. And that's something that you guys talk a lot about in your book. When we, when we talk about like the transparency that you had throughout the entire process of read, like of where you began, even when you were doing trainings together. And I'm just curious. So you had a book before this that you wrote together. Why did you decide to, and it was about project-based learning. So why did you decide to write another one? Yeah. So <laughs> So um, I, I think ultimately it comes down to making a difference, right? Like doing things for the right reason. And that's really making a difference for students. And I think an extension of that is the idea that we wrote um, Hacking Project-Based Learning. I'm going to say it came up December 2016. Does that sound right? I think that sounds right. And, and since then, we've done a whole lot of speaking, consulting, working with educators across the country on how to implement inquiry and PBL into their learning spaces. And because of that, we've learned. We, we've we've learned a lot, and because we've learned a lot, we thought that we had more to say. And that's really what this book is. It started out as more of like a um, like a graphic heavy book. Like if you think of a couple books out there, like um, The Space by Rebecca Hare and Bob Dylan, and also um, Intention by Dan Ryder and Amy Burval. I think I got both of those right. Mm -hmm. Both both great books. So we started with like a graphic heavy book and like, to be honest, like I just kept writing and Aaron was like, what the heck are you doing? And like, well, we have more to say. This isn't the book we started out with, but it was just like, we had more to say. And we thought that this is potentially the last book we write on inquiry and PBL. So why not pack everything we can into that? And each chapter is based on a common question that we have heard or that we have had when, um, engaged in project-based learning, whether it's professional development or implementing it in our own spaces. And then we're also, we also say that not only does each chapter answer one of those questions, like how about direct instruction, inquiry, you know, what is the relationship between PBL and inquiry? How do I get grades? All that stuff. And, but we also say, not only do we answer those questions, but also all of our answers strung together detail um, how to actually do project-based learning in its entirety. Yeah. Um, Aaron, do you want to add anything before I talk about my the PBL paralysis? Nope, nope I nailed it. I nailed it. You, you did, honestly. Nailed. Like, 
the <laughs> part you added at the end was what I was going to say. So I think, that, you know, A plus for Ross tonight. <laughs> yes, so and I want to throw in a hi to Rochelle. She's watching. So I was telling Erin, when I was reading this, like, I was like, I, I said a curse word, but I'm not going to say it right now. But I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this. Like, I was probably more of the project teacher, not really the, you know, I couldn't do the full PBL for a lot of the reasons that you guys wrote about. Um, but right when I got to the first PBL paralysis graphic, like, I felt like I came back down to earth because I thought, okay, like, you guys knew you were, you were already encountering that, like, there were going to be problems. And the way that you spaced out these PBL paralysis graphics was really legit awesome like it, you know what you're doing you know because i felt like okay maybe i can't do this after all okay so um tell us a little bit about the pbl paralysis kind of the ideas behind that and the graphics that you used yeah so i mean honestly the term itself that we kind of coined came from exactly that moment that you just described where people start hearing about pbl whether it's in a training or some you know admin somewhere who's like project-based learning wah, wah, wah. And, you know, and then they start digging into it and they get to this point where they're like, oh, my God, no way. Can't do it. Can't do it. Um, either can't or I'm already doing it. Like, so there's it's just we, we used to call them like pause points. We actually grappled with this term a little bit. Um, like, why? Like, were we going to call it paralysis? But essentially, it was like this feeling of like, I can't go any further. So either I'm doing it and I don't need to move forward or I. I'm scared. <laughs> I can't do it. So that's really where this term PBL paralysis came from. And, um, you know, I think it started as a blog post and like turned into like all these, you know, and then ultimately the reason it ended up in the book was because as Ross said, we sort of started with this idea that the book was going to be really graphic heavy and we wanted it to be super turnkey, like ways that people could overcome PBL paralysis. So those were like quick, um, I, I'm going to reuse the word turnkey. So like quick turnkey ideas that could be immediately implemented to um, overcome some of the biggest challenges to implementing project-based learning. Yeah, I, I was, I, I think it was more, maybe not scared, just overwhelmed, like, oh my God, I don't think I can do all of these things. But you, you talk about how it's a process. It's not like somebody can just get right into it, especially, and you even talk about this, when we were, I remember getting evaluated as a, as all of my students were, for being compliant, like coming from a compliance-based background to this as an early teacher to you know more years in the classroom this is not super easy for those of us and Erin I know your background is you started this kind of from the get-go you too Ross right mm -hmm. yeah my so technic so I actually had the opposite um, experience where when I went through all of my pre-service teaching, I was trained in inquiry-based, project-based instruction, um, where I did, again, where I did my pre-service, it was all hands-on. Kids were never in their seats. Like it was a workbook or a basal reader were just nobody even like that. Those weren't words that people said. Um, so yeah. then I had to like learn how to teach to kids who were like supposed to be sitting in their seats reading a basal reader. So I was like unlearning that. And I, I really think that that's where like um, the, the idea that like we can now clearly articulate how to do some of these things is because of, you know, our learning and unlearning and then relearning again, that process really sort of like solidified the how to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, that is, I mean, that's pretty amazing that you were doing that right out, out, you know, out the doors, because this is something that I think a lot of educators are kind of older like me. I don't know how old you are, but I'm a little bit old. So, um, <laughs> but it really is like an unlearning. It definitely is. Um, and I'm trying to get to my next questions, but um, I thought that was interesting, Erin, when you talked about this, when we were on Rochelle together, when we were doing our Thrive in Education, about how you had, like, this is something that was natural for you. And so um, I'm just curious, though, another part of your book, the grades and the feedback, like, 
both of you are administrators or have been in the administration role. How does this even look like? You talk about how grades, you're, you're both down. You're like, no, we don't need grades. We need feedback. How does that even work in the real, like in the public school system? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So it, it works. It depends on your context, like just like anything else. So working at the, ele so at the elementary level, um, it, it, for the most part, it is a lot easier to implement feedback in lieu of grades. Um, I think then w once we've accepted that at the elementary level, it's like, what does that feedback look like? You know, so one of the big things we talk about in the book, the chapter on uh, grading and assessment is the idea of self-assessment and peer assessment and, th and the different components that are involved in order to promote student agency for students to self-assess and then peer assess. And then of course you're going to need some teacher feedback as well. So that's really, especially at the elementary level, um, where, 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 where you want to be, right? That, that self-assessment and that peer assessment. And I think it's easier to get there. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier to get there because I think in general at the elementary level, there's this acceptance that grades aren't as important. Um, as you hit the middle level, and high school level, um, most most middle schools and most high schools are not standards based, um, like standards based report, report cards or standards based practices. So it's a little bit tougher. It's like okay, like we need grades for college, or we need grades to get into an honors class. So it's th those conversations are important, and it, it's different from district to district and school to school. But ultimately, you approach it through the lens of okay, we know feedback. Um, helps to drive learning more so than grades, given all the constraints of what we're dealing with, as much as possible, how can we put, um, how can we use feedback instead of grades? And there might be some, there might be some limitations such as like, okay, the report card's not gonna change. We're dealing with a, like a learning management system that has the re report cards have to be structured a certain way. We have to deal with the community, um, you know, who, who's wary of standards-based grading because they heard about it from their friends who are doing it in their local district and they didn't like it there. Um, but I think, I think it definitely can be done. Um, like I said, the older students get and the older, you know, the older students get it, it's, it's tougher, but I, but I think it's definitely, definitely conversations, um, that are worth having no matter what level we're at. And even in mm -hmm. the, and even in the circumstances where you work in a place where there are traditional grades, there are ways to leverage those traditional grades in, more feedback focused ways. And a very, very quick way for me to explain that is like to make sure that your grades are actually based on a clear learning target. So rather than just like I'm giving the unit two test, um, what skills or knowledge were you hoping to acquire from that and make it transparent to students, their parents, the community, whoever, whoever's <laughs> like gonna see this information, mm -hmm how students performed on that target versus just unit two tests. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you even talk about, and this is something that I feel kind of silly to say out loud, but you talk about this and I don't know, I, I did this for years, but taking grades on directions, <laughs> like there's a difference between the targets and the directions. And I just really started evaluating how misguided migrating practices were and, um, that I, that just really stuck out to me because when you're going into PBL, you want to be descriptive, and but you want them to think for themselves and make their choices. But it would I see how it'd be easy for someone just to go back to the directions and the checklist and to grade it on that. But we're trying to get away from that. Uh, that it's just it, I want you to know it was really it was a lot for my mind to process. I agreed with all of it in theory. I'm just like, how in the world do I do this? I, I do have a question. What was the feedback from like when you were starting this and as you, you know, got better throughout the years, what was the feedback from students and parents? How did it change? Yeah, I think I think the more that we did it, and I'll just speak frankly, the more you do it, the more progressive you become. And then the, I think we said this in the book, the further removed you are from what parents and students come to expect from their education. So even though like you think you're getting better and more proficient every year, um, in the eyes of other people, um, it, you're, you're almost like moving backwards. Like they're like, like, so the better you get, the more of a disconnect there can be, 
right? So, and I will say right. for myself personally that, like, I knew that this is the way I wanted to teach, and I firmly believe this is how my students should should really learn. Um, as a classroom teacher, no matter how proactive I was, I could honestly say every year, you know, there were a couple of, you know, it was tough. Like, there were always a couple of parents who were like, my child's used to getting A's. He's not getting A's this year. More or less, it's your fault. And I think it's really, we're in the field of customer service. So it's it's trying to understand where they're coming from um, not com and still standing up for, for what you believe in, but really just trying to understand where, where they're coming from and listening, seeking to understand um, and, and working together as much as possible without sacrificing what you believe in. Um, I think that, you know, one of the big mistakes that I made as a teacher is like kind of this whole idea. I say implementing best practice overnight isn't best practice. And just saying right. like, welcome to fourth grade. You're going to learn differently this year, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think promoting more of a gradual release, um, can definitely help, can definitely, can, can definitely help while, um, keeping the lines of communication open along the way. Um, but I think for the most part, I'm painting it like doom and gloom. I was going to say, I had an yeah. opposite experience. Erin was great. I was terrible and she was great. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think, I think I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying this because in reality, this is something we all deal with. And if we paint this picture, like we didn't deal with any pushback, one, we're lying, but two, when those who are going through this learning curve now are, are experiencing pushback, they start to think, man, I'm doing this wrong because they internalize it as this pushback is, is this pushback is exclusive to me. And that's why I think it's important for us to be transparent about our journeys. So when other people have issues, they're like, okay, it's okay. I'm trying to tackle the same hurdles that other people have tackled. It's fine. Um, now I just need to to, to get through them, to get to where I need to be and to where my students need to be. But, but like, I will say that the majority of it worked out well, um, every year for the, like, and that's a generalization, but there, of course there was always some pushback no matter how hard I tried. I think that, so I definitely had the, those experiences where it was like parents were like, well, what is going on? And they're just making crafts. Like, I don't need to send my kid to school all, like all day to do crafts. Like that was a, that was a <laughs> comment that happened a lot. They're doing crafts. Um, so a few like specific things that I think I changed across my experience that then changed how much pushback I got. Um, I became super transparent. So we talked a little bit about learning targets and and that those knowledge statements and the way we have and like we talk in the book about like ways to have kids reflect and sort of capture their learning each day. So when parents started to see that stuff, like my kids said that they learned that um, that sort of like built the street cred around it. So like, sure, they're building a structure and they're using some hot glue. But really what they're talking about is like what. Uh, what they're going to need to like survive in the specific environment. And like they did this, this, and this kind of research in order to get to that point. Um, so that helped. And two, um, at the time that Ross and I were working together, we walk, worked in a building where there was a ton of parent involvement. Like they wanted to be in the building. So I invited parents in. I was like, come on in, listen to them, watch them do this. Like listen to the conversations that these kids are having while they're doing these crafts that you're, that you're talking about. Um, so that again, really changed the dialogue and like the experience that people had around it. Um, and you know, parents talk. So when one parent's like, Oh no, I was there and I saw it. Like that sort of changes the dialogue. Yeah. And I, I think it's so funny that they thought it was crafts. I'm sorry. That just makes me laugh. Yeah. But um, have you, have any of your students come back and said like this really like changed my life or anything? Have you had any feedback from students? Yeah, I, I think, you know, occasionally, you know, you get the social media message up from students. Um, I've gotten it on LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, a couple former students have friended me on Facebook, um, Twitter, you know, all, all this, you know, not t I'm not, I'm not hip enough to be on TikTok or Snapchat just yet. Um, but, you know, we, I've gotten those messages and, um, and, and from parents too, you know, from parents too, um, who, you know, who have definitely, I think, um, you know, kept the lines of communication open or didn't, but just, you know, seemed to appreciate, um, you know, what was done. So yeah. it, it feels good. You know, it feels good. 
and I have the benefit, like I still work in the district where I spent most of my time teaching. Yeah. Um, and so every year with like around graduation time, so around this time, I don't know, I always like wonder like, is some teacher somewhere telling these kids to email past teachers? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you know, I get like three or four or five emails from kids that are like, I, I was felt really involved in your class. I really enjoyed learning like that. Um, you know, I had one kid last year was like, I pursued Project Lead the Way because I realized that I really enjoyed engineering in your, you know, when I was in your classroom. So yeah, definitely feedback from kids, I would say, leans towards the positive. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love that. And I know that you wrote like a lot about relationships and then how to start that from day one because this can't really be implemented if you don't have good relationships with the community, not just the students, but also their parents, like you guys said, um, and just that that safety to get it wrong, you know, and, and, and to fail a little bit, but to learn from all of that. So I did appreciate that chapter as well. And I think you wrote that, Erin. I, well, we wrote it all together. <laughs> yeah, I just remember seeing your name. I remember seeing the names in parentheses from okay. like whoever, yeah, when it, but, um, and on this grades and feedback, Ross, I'm hoping there is a part that I would love for you to read from your book, if you're willing, if you don't mind. Got it. Got it right here. What? What? Where are we going? Yes. Where? where I I, I liked page 131 when you talk about like some of the pushbacks that you received at the very beginning. But of course, if there's another place in the book that you just absolutely love, then I would love for you to read that. No, I'll I'll read a little bit. Um brings back, you know, terrible, terrible memories, but I'll do it because you asked nicely. Um, so toward, toward page 131, toward the start of my project-based learning journey, I found myself a few weeks into the new school year and it started to go downhill. Even though I believed I had all the answers, students didn't seem to be buying into my approach and several families were confused as to what was going on in the classroom. To make matters worse, one of my students disenrolled, leaving for a private school in the area. While I wasn't entirely responsible for this move, the parent of another student informed me that my radical teaching style was the deciding factor. And during this same conversation, she tried to tell me about concerns from other parents. Her words fell on deaf ears, and she knew it because I thought I knew best. Um, let's do one or two more paragraphs. Because that, that would be a terrible way to like cut things off. Um, soon, right. after, soon after this conversation, <laughs> the situation came to a head during Meet the Teacher Night. A few parents who obviously didn't feel that they were being heard went out of their way to embarrass me and mock my teaching style in front of other parents. The whole time, I was literally counting down the minutes until the session would end while using all of my patience to keep my composure and respond to each accusation in the most politically correct way possible. We'll do one more paragraph and then I think that'll be a good, actually, we're just going to do the whole thing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, while most I, of think you should go, I think you should do the whole thing, honestly. Well, well, most I think it's happened, good. Well, most of what happened next is now a blur. I do remember everyone leaving the classroom and then I sat down at my desk for quite a while in an attempt to mentally process what had just happened and pull myself back together. During this time, one of the parents stopped by again to touch base and console me a bit. Then my principal, Dr. Anthony Moyer, paid me a visit to see how everything went. Not holding anything back, I explained to Tony in detail what had transpired, which speaks to the kind of relationship Tony and I had. And then what happens is, at the end of the night, I checked my mailbox and found that Tony had taped the following quote to it. And the quote, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, <laughs> it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how, how the strong man stumbles, blah, 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 blah. It's a quote, uh, The Man the, in the Arena by Theodore Roosevelt, which was popularized by uh, Brene Brown's Darren Greatly. Um, uh, and then I took the quote with me into an adjacent conference room, had a seat and cried for a good 10 minutes. All the nights twists and turns I got to me and I just had to let it all out. Um, looking back, I realized that one problem was my arrogance. Another issue which we'll address in this chapter um, is that implement, and this is what I just talked about before, implementing best practice overnight is not best practice because people Students and their parents or guardians are impacted by every decision we make rather than railroading our ideas while attempting to sell others and what we think is best. We could take a collaborative approach, meeting others where they are and moving along until our practices are where we think they should be. And at the end of every school year, we'll most likely have to painstakingly press the reset button. 
So that is the beginning of our chapter on how do I build a, uh, how do I build the PBL culture? And, um, mm -hmm. and that, that story really illustrates, I think, putting the book away, like one of the, one of the mistakes that I made that implementing best practice overnight is not best practice. And I think the other mistake that we touch upon is this whole idea of like, set it and forget it. Okay. Like I've done a couple hands-on minds on activities at the beginning of the year. We did, we did like the marshmallow challenge. We walked, watched a couple of videos about Apple and Google or IDEO or design thinking. And now we're ready to go full steam ahead with project-based learning, not realizing that everything we do uh, throughout the year impacts um, and influences the culture of our learning space in one way or another. So it's not, it's not build an innovative culture or talk about an innovative culture and then do innovative things. The two um, have to go hand in hand throughout the duration of the year. Yeah. Are, are we crying? Well, are we? We're, we're <laughs> I, 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 I didn't cry. I got, I did get emotional when I read it and I really am glad that you were, you were able to read it, but I think that it's, it's very, you know, honest. And a lot of us have made a lot of mistakes um, from, you know, the growth of our careers. And I, and I appreciated that. And um, kind of, you know, it, it was sad, but you made it through. Obviously, you're very successful. You're 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 doing great things. You wrote a book for crying out loud mm -hmm. with an amazing co-author. And so the last kind of thing I want to touch on is finding <laughs> an entry point. <laughs> Did you see his face? He was like, well. Yeah. 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 No, she's, well, she's I wonderful. know the truth. <laughs> she is wonderful. Yeah. But I did feel encouraged when um, when it got to the end of the book. And I was telling Aaron earlier, like, I couldn't believe I couldn't put it down. Like, I couldn't believe that I could, like, read through all of this and feel encouraged. Because at the beginning, I felt really overwhelmed. But at the end, you talk about entry points. You give great ways to start entry points. Um, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts about this and um, well, anything you want to share about how to start PBL. Yeah, so I'll... I'll start just by saying that we often give the analogy of like people getting in the pool, right? So if the pool is where project-based learning lives, um, you know, everybody sort of gets in the pool in a different way. So some kid, some people, right, are just ready to like run and they're cannonballing into the into right. the deep end and they're set. While you know, some of the rest of us are still like putting our sunscreen on and in, in the lounge chair. So really, the idea is like finding the entry point that works for you. And as long as you're making that progress, that's really what matters. Um, so when it comes to an entry point, I think the biggest picture way to, des to describe this too, like we get some really specific examples in, the, in that chapter, and I'll maybe yes. like talk about that in a second. But in the big picture, the... The entry point is to think about project-based learning, not as a whole thing, but as, and Ross explained this earlier, sort of as a series of best practices that all fit together into project-based learning. So if, if you are feeling overwhelmed by PBL, and maybe the place for you to start is on feedback. So doing feedback really well is part of quality project-based learning. So if that's a good place for you to start. Maybe that's something you're already kind of good at and you just feel like, okay, strengths-based like strengths -based leadership. Um, so like, I just want to keep focusing in that area. Or, you know, we talk in the book a little bit, we talk in the book about like how direct instruction fits into project-based learning. And, you know, we kind of, we break yes. it into two different parts. And one of them is this concept of mini lessons. So if you're the kind of person that's like, I could never possibly deliver all of my content in less than 45 minutes of lecture every single day, then maybe the place for you to start is how can I consolidate the I do part <laughs> of my child of the of the kids learning experience and focus more on giving them some time on and for um time for them to explore right so like that's one piece of it that you could focus on first without trying to grapple with all of PBL all at one time mm -hmm. yeah and i loved and i thought and to myself like where i would start is the inquiry um you talked about how like just letting them play Nope, given the explanation. And I know that is something that I have learned like in several different PDs, but I still want to explain everything. Like, I feel like maybe that's the standardized testing over my head to make sure that they understand all of that. So that's really hard for me to grapple with. But I thought when I wake up this morning and I'm teaching my kids, like 
getting out the materials and just letting them grapple with it a little bit and uh, play and then talking about that, that was where I personally thought I could start. And I appreciated that what you put in there and what you just said, Aaron, like wherever you are in this spectrum, you can find an entry place and you don't have to do it all at once. Um, and that just made me feel like I actually can do this. So I did appreciate that. Ross, did you want to say anything about any of that? Or are you good? No, I, I just think it's this idea that like to say there's one place to start doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, we, we hear, and we hear that a lot. Like you need to start by doing this. You need to start by doing that. And I think everybody's, there's no one right way to do it. And everybody's context is different. So in the book we talk about, you could start with Genius Hour, you know, which is basically students wanting to investigate or learn about whatever they want, right? Which is a great way to put the students at the center of the learning, um, low floor, high ceiling. Um, you know, transitioning from hands on to minds on, flexible learning spaces, uh, getting better at feedback, as Aaron said, student self-assessment. Really, it's a bunch of best practices that are strung together. And I think a lot of times when we just say, okay, like everyone's going to do one PBL unit this year. It's a lot. If you're not used to doing a lot of these practices and all of a sudden it's like, you're going to do all of them. It's a lot. It, it, mm -hmm. it, and it's in, and in a lot of instances, it's too much. And then what happens is when it's too much and overwhelming is we tend to go back to what we were doing before and instead of making progress, yeah. we've, we've moved backwards. Right. So I think, um, so I think it's important to be cognizant of the complexities of PBL and realize that it's PB, I say like project-based learning is not an event, right? It's not like the progressive practice we stick in the middle of what we've always done. It's something we transition to over time, along a continuum, and eventually we reach project-based learning. And even then we could do better because we could always refine our practices and the teaching and learning that's occurring in our space. And I'll say that when we work with, like when we work with other districts, we often meet with the administrators first and say that very thing. like. You, if we don't want teachers to expect cookie cutter from their kids, then we can't expect cookie cutter from our teachers. Right. So we need to be ready. Like you as the leader who are going to be, in, you're going to be in the building every day. You need to be ready to differentiate your language and your expectation based on yeah. the current strengths of your team and what they're going to need from you moving forward. Oh yeah. I think that's great. Well, we have come to the end of our time and I just want to say congratulations to both of you for an awesome book. Um, I, a lot of the books that I've been reading lately um, are great for, you know, groups and everything like this, but I really think that your book is something that like, if you're tired of going to professional developments, this is something that you could do personally and um, it would be a great read on your own things that you, like, it's good to talk about it with people, but I still think that like, Anybody could pick this up, teacher at any grade level could pick this up and start putting some of these practices and the very next day, like you don't have to be um, a, a pro at this and begin. So I really did appreciate that. And I wanna say to everybody who's watching, um, thank you so much for tuning in. If you do get this book, and I did put the link in the comments and you love it, leave a review. That's how you share your love with authors is leaving them a review. So thank you so much for tuning in. Do you do either of you have any last words that you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Thank you so much for having us. I enjoy, I love your energy. It's so fun to be in this space with you. So I appreciate what you're doing and what you do for authors. So thank you. Uh, oh yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, and I'll say, you know, to, to the um, to the teachers who are um, hopefully listening, thank you for all you've done this year to work your way through a, a pandemic. Um, believe it or not, although we, we are very passionate about project-based learning and inquiry, uh, right now and throughout the year, there are more important things than that, like our, our emotional and physical well-being. But although we still love project-based learning, and to those, to those of you administrators out there, don't be tone deaf, right? Although I know a lot of administrators, especially those like who aren't necessarily in buildings um, or so-called like thought leaders or um, futurists who aren't in buildings really are, you know, are out there saying we need to leverage a pandemic to move forward, you know, like and, and reimagine education. Don't be tone deaf to what's really going on in buildings right now. And some of those great ideas that you think you have, maybe listen to your people and put them on the back burner until people are ready to hear them and implement them. Love it. Great words. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, and everyone, I'll see you next week. Bye.